Are you all curious to see what's going on? You really want to know? Come on here. I'll take you by the hand and I will show you what great things are coming. So besides some stick aluminum welding here, and that's an old thing, you've seen it on weld tube already. And instead of having to beat the slag off like crazy, it's just peeling off all by itself, just flicking it off with a rod, just like 7018. And everybody says it's not possible. So you came here to see the impossible. So a while back, I took a Miller seminar in Indianapolis, and I want to show some of the knowledge that I got there. And um, let's talk about oxide layers today. So here's what took me about 20 years to figure out. Aluminum oxide. This is essentially when the aluminum starts to corrode on steel, you would call it rust. When the aluminum itself starts to disintegrate. So people say you have to use a stainless steel wire brush you can only brush stroke in one direction then you have to acetone wipe it and brush again and wipe and brush whatever procedure they have to clean the oxide layer and then people say oh that oxide layer forms instantaneously as soon as you're done brushing so and I'm confused do you have to clean it or you don't have to clean it or what's really happening so why why do you clean it if it shows up right away again and it always confused me and um, at this Miller seminar I actually learned for the first time in um, 20 years basically how it really works and why it works and what you really have to do so essentially there is like I want to say two different kinds of oxides which is really the same oxide once it's dry and once it's wet so the way how this works here is let's deal with the dry kind first uh, it happens basically instantaneously forms in minutes sometimes even seconds after exposure to air so if you just wire brush like outside in the air not in a argon perch chamber it happens and it happens like right away the key is self-limiting thickness of four to five nanometers so that is really the key here what's happening is that oxide layer will never grow any thicker than that as long as it's dry so it's a very thin oxide film that the welding arc will break even a DC welding arc on MIG or on stick welding aluminum you don't necessarily need AC on a TIG machine you could DC weld with helium and the heat of the welding arc would break that oxide layer before it melts the aluminum underneath although it takes like 27 or 8 2800 degrees to break that oxide layer open and it only takes about 1200 for the aluminum to um, liquefy so you can weld it but it all works out the way it's designed to so from there we go to the wet kind the hydrated oxide it is essentially the same oxide you're adding water to it um, forms of aluminum after exposure to moisture so you have this piece of aluminum you say heck aluminum doesn't rust I'm gonna lay it outside the shop for like three weeks five months and see what happens the problem is now this oxide layer gets wet and now it grows it's no more self-limiting thickness to f four to five nanometers it just keeps forming and piling on and piling on at some point you can see it with the naked eye when it turns white kind of salty or chalky and it gets so thick that you really can't weld through it and even alternating current on a TIG machine has a hard time to break through that oxide layer so that's really the oxide you need to remove now does that mean that you have to absolutely brush every piece of aluminum you get from your aluminum vendor when it's brand new I guess the answer is depends you need to figure out for yourself what you do what code work is how thick your oxide layer is and these people that don't clean anything 
and how they get lucky once or more than just once I guess this whole video here starts to explain why and how and how this happens so this seminar was really geared towards aluminum MIG and pulse MIG um, this year also holds true for um, TIG or stick welding it has to do with aluminum being an excellent thermal conductor and essentially sucking the heat right out of your weld joint out of the area where your torch your arc whatever made the heat lit up and and introduce the heat so if you want to avoid cold starts you need to have a little bit higher current a little bit higher settings in the beginning to kind of punch in I mean you can preheat and preheat will help a uh, hot start gives you that extra edge on certain things some machines do have hot start others don't if you don't have hot start for sure you need to preheat if you do have hot start you may or may not have to preheat depends on your application and your settings uh, preheated materials need different weld settings if you're looking for consistency you want to always start with material ideally the same temperature so you can run the same settings so you get repeatability and consistency though so there is certain applications especially in the auto body collision repair world where you always start with cold material and very thin material where it doesn't need that much to heat up in the first place and in order to get repeatability and consistency your aluminum that you weld on is basically always room temperature cold to the touch so you know no weld is longer than two or three inches at the most so again do you have to preheat or or don't you have to preheat that's something else you need to decide on a case-by-case -case situation so then crater fill weld termination so what do you do when you come to the end of the weld you need to make sure you have no crater crack originating Miller suggests a couple different solutions here um, reversing of the travel speed uh, and backing up I'm not sure uh, on MIG you may have gas coverage issues depending on how you hold the gun unless you flip the gun around too on stick this is rather problematic but typically if you have the option to lower your settings uh, that would be like using a crater fill function or so or having a, a remote control manually if you can reduce on a MIG your wire speed and your voltage both proportional at the same time on stick if you can lower your amperage it will help you to fill the crater essentially kind of pile up cooler ish material in the crater as it's still liquid and fill the crater that way so here I made some welds with a uh, $10,000 Miller machine with a push-pull gun with remote control functions and with a um, uh, separate power source and feeder uh, this is a very uh, coarse double pulse weld here and this is a double pulse weld with the speed that is factory uh, preset the other one was like manually tweaked a little bit and um, welds look respectable uh, I didn't really dial the crater function in all the way uh, it, it works it welds real well so I also tried this spool gun off of a uh, 211 and um, it works well it, it works the way it's supposed to part of the issue is they're using this 4943 wire which requires about an additional volt or volt and a half on the synergic curve and the way how the 211 is designed is it's an absolutely great machine totally designed after the KISS concept keep it simple stupid and um, it will not let you allow to deviate off the synergic curve so essentially as you're welding with this wire that requires more voltage it's always a little bit cool it's always a little bit crackly it's not a full spray arc it's like borderline short circuiting um, I wish if you could dial it up just an extra volt and have it spray real nice uh, maybe you have to use a uh, helium mixture um, to make up for the for it being too cool since you can't adjust the voltage I mean it's not really bad the machine itself is is nice and well it's nice if you would use the alloy that's actually intended for and now if you use the new hyper alloy that they have 
uh, now you can't adjust the machine enough accordingly to make up for it so maybe they shot themselves a little bit in the foot there but all overall I mean I had a great time being there um, I'm very glad I went I have learned valuable information that I've not learned before and um, I'm glad to pass some of this on to you guys thank you see you next time